So in a few weeks, my family is going to be going on a camping trip. Now it's funny this morning because I shared that with Sarah and Todd and they went, you camping? So I don't know what it is about my demeanor that that seemed surprising, but something must have been. And it's been a long time since we have gone camping with Corey's parents and family. And some of it, the reason for the time of doing that is that just distance and availability, but there's also another reason. And the last time that we went camping with them, years ago was a complete disaster. So we normally, they would always encourage us to come in October to go camping with them at this campsite in Wisconsin. And it was always a really fun time when our kids were little. Uh, It was like the, the second weekend of October. It was the last time that the campsite would be open. And all of the camp ground, um, all of the campers and tents and everything, they would all decorate with lights and just all kinds of stuff. The kids would put on costumes and they could trick or treat from from camper to camper. And it was just a really fun weekend for them. And we had taken our kids in the past and they loved it. So they had asked us about three years ago, can you come again? And it just so happened that we had a few days off from school and the timing worked out. And so we drove from Kansas to Wisconsin for a camping trip. Uh, That did not seem like a wise choice, and it ended up not being one. So we get there on a Thursday, and it's freezing, even unseasonably cold for Wisconsin at that point. I mean, we are absolutely freezing. Thank goodness I still had some gloves and uh, scarves and hats, so we just bundled up, and it was fine. We sat around the fire, and it it was great. Like, it was cold, but we were fine. But then Thursday night, it started to rain all night long. And we woke up on Friday morning, and what had been this beautiful campsite is now a mud pit. I mean, the kind of mud that when you put your boot in it, it sticks like cement and you can't get it out. Like, that was the entire campsite. And it kept raining during the day on Friday. And so a farmer came out with these big bales of hay and was selling bales of hay to all the different uh, sites. And people were putting it down on top of the mud, thinking this will dry it out. And so we were watching everybody did this. He sold out in like two seconds. So then people were trying to just maintain, thinking it's got to get better. It's got, things have got to improve. It's got to get better. So we did that. We survived. We stayed out there on Friday. And then Friday night, it started raining again. And at this point, I, now, when we go camping, my only thing that I expect is that I don't have to sleep in a tent. So like everybody else can sleep in a tent, but I'm not going to. So I sleep in the camper. Our family sleeps in the camper with Corey's parents. And I'm laying underneath what is supposed to be this waterproof tarp canvas thing on the pop-up. And no water should come through unless you touch it, right? And then that's, so I'm not going to touch it. I'm just laying there. And I'm watching as I'm hearing the rain pour. I'm watching droplets of water starts coming and then just falling on my face as I'm getting wetter and wetter as I'm sleeping. And so we woke up the next morning and what had been a mud pit that is now covered with hay is now a gross hay mud just extravaganza. It's just fantastic. And at that point, our family just says, we're done. We got we to gotta just put it in, patch it up. And I know that we've done all of this work setting up this camp. But this is miserable. Like, it is ridiculous to stay here and put up with this. And it was actually more funny watching us try to pack up a campsite in the mud than than actually put the campsite up. I mean, we didn't even take our pajamas off at that point. We literally carried one child at a time. We didn't even let them walk on the ground to the cars, put them in, and then the grown-ups literally in their pajamas closed everything down. It was disgusting. I'm telling you, the shower and my in-laws never felt so great. But it was interesting, as we were driving away, how many people stayed? We knew what the forecast was. We knew it was going to keep raining. We knew that this was a crummy situation. And yet, so many people chose to stay and sit there in the mud. It boggled my mind 
how would this be something you would choose to do? I mean, when you're thinking of dwelling in the pit, that was it. And so it made me think, as I was looking at Ezekiel 33 and praying that my upcoming camping trip isn't going to be like that, uh, it made me think of Ezekiel 33. So if you want to go to that chapter, that would be great. Now, we've been jumping around in Ezekiel some, and I know I gave you one of the first few weeks, I gave you a layout of how it's broken down. At this point in Ezekiel 33, Uh, This is the point now where God has given messages of doom and destruction to the exiles in um, Babylon. He has talked about what's going to happen to that the temple is going to fall, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, and he's also given judgment, um, uh, judgment instructions to the neighboring territories as well. And then chapter 33 happens, and this chapter is kind of like a hinge that swings the door from messages of doom and destruction on Israel instead to messages of hope and restoration. So it's kind of like now we can breathe. (sighs) Now we're no longer in just doom and destruction. And at the beginning of Ezekiel 33, God calls Ezekiel to be a watchman. And this idea was not new. He actually did it. He called him to be that in chapter 3. He called him to be that in chapter 18. And now he's doing it again. And the first two times, in 3 and 18, it was to point out judgment. This is what you're doing. This is what's going to happen. But now, in 33, he's called again. But instead of pointing out judgment, he's going to be pointing to hope. He's going to be pointing to a way out. God, he's going to talk to Ezekiel in this chapter about this one nation of people that are split up into two different dwelling places, two different homes. And both of those homes that they are in right now both remind me of that muddy campsite. Both groups of people, for specific reasons, chose to remain in their muddy condition, like the campers who continue to sit in the rain and the mud and dwell in a miserable existence of living. Last week, Corey talked about what was happening in Jerusalem in the temple, that God gave Ezekiel a picture of how bad things had gotten in God's house, that it no longer was God's house. And at this point, that was in Ezekiel 8. Now this is years later, and now what has happened is that house has been destroyed. All of it has been destroyed. And all of those captives, those people that had remained in Israel, most of them had either died or been taken out in captivity. But there were still a few that remained there. A few that had not been killed, a few that had not died for some reason, a few that had not been pulled into captivity. And what these people are doing at this point in Israel, in Jerusalem, is living in rubble. So these are people, this is this first group of people that are literally living in like a war zone, in a rubble-filled war zone. And either they're living there, or they've left the city, and they're living in the wild, or they're living in the caves in that area. There's a bit of people left. And I would say, these people remaining in Jerusalem, if I was going to give the house, whatever their dwelling place is, I would say that they are living still in Jerusalem in the house of shame. And if you go with me to Ezekiel 33, verses 23 through 26, I'll unpack that. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, the people living in those ruins in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one man, yet he possessed this land, but we are many. Surely the land has been given to us as our possession. Therefore say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Since you eat meat with the blood still in it and look to your idols and shed blood, should you then possess the land? You rely on your sword, you do detestable things, and each of you defiles his neighbor's wife. Should you then possess the land? And what's happening here? So this is not the exiles. This is the few people who are left in the destroyed Jerusalem. 
What's happening here is that this pile of worthless rubble is being inhabited by basically squatters. They're saying, this is now mine. They're saying, this is unclaimed, and so by inheritance and default, because everyone else is either dead or carted away, it's mine. It's mine because I am part of this line. I am the inheritor of the promises made to my forefathers. And so they decided, we're just going to resettle right in the middle of all of this. But what were they settling in? What were they claiming as theirs? A wasteland. There was nothing there. And what they were doing there was trying to edge anybody else out through violence. They said that they stood on the sword. What that means is it's oppressing others any way possible to get it so it's just mine. Devious measures. And it reminded me, I told you, I know I've talked to you a little bit about how I'm studying Hosea at the same time as I'm studying Ezekiel. And the parallels there. In chapters nine, in chapter nine, verse 10, it talks about the house of Israel and it says they consecrated themselves to shame. The Israelites, they couldn't stay in God's house, which could be entered with a repentant heart because they'd already made themselves at home in shame's house. That's where they decided to settle in by making other things come before God and then blatantly crying out with every fiber of their being that all they desired was to keep running away from him. Now God's house, the temple, it wasn't even there. It was a pile of rocks and the ruins that they were sitting in literally represented their ruined souls. It was as if they were saying, I'm gonna sit here in this mud and filth, but it's all mine. That's what they're saying. It's my inheritance. Well, when you live in this house of shame, what you receive, your inheritance, it has no value. It has less than value. It is a worthless inheritance. And in God, in his holiness, as much as it grieves him, he's, we've talked about it before, he's gonna give us what we want. He's going to give us what we ask for, even if it's our own destruction. We've, and the thing is, this, it's not like they didn't know. They had been warned time and time again in Deuteronomy, early on, said you have a choice, blessings or curses. Choose well. It wasn't like they didn't know. It was that in their knowing, they willfully chose to rebel and to be consecrated, set apart, for shame. And God gives them the inheritance of their new home, which is destruction. If you read on in verse 27, this is what God says because of what they want to do. Say this to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, as surely as I live, those who are left in the ruins will fall by the sword. Those out in the country I will give to the wild animals to be devoured and those in strongholds and caves will die of a plague. I will make the land a desolate waste and her proud strength will come to an end and the mountains of Israel will become desolate so that no one will cross them. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I have made the land a desolate waste because they have done detestable things. Now that's a hard group of people to identify with, isn't it? It's a hard group of people. I mean, it's important that we talk about it so we understand what was happening. But I think it's often hard to identify with the Jews that were trying to fruitlessly resettle in the city, choosing to call themselves God's children but live in this house of shame. I think it's hard to imagine willfully saying, I'm going to consecrate myself to shame through the worship of idols and rebellious living. But what about this other group of people that really is Ezekiel's flock, the people that are the exiles in Babylon? What would we call the place where they are at, their dwelling place, where they dwell spiritually? Well, God talks to Ezekiel about that as well. So you're going to rewind a little bit and go back to Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 10. Now he's talking about the exiles. 
Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? This is what the exiles are wailing. We are weighed down because of our offenses. How can we live? Now it sounds like finally they are on the right track because they haven't said anything like that before. They've never accounted to the fact that they have offenses. Finally, they are realizing there is some element of guilt, but confession in and of itself isn't repentance. All they're really doing here is saying, yeah, I'm guilty, but ouch, it hurts. That's all they're saying. They're crying out in pain. They're wallowing in their brokenness. Think of that campsite again. These would be the people that bunker down and decide, I'm not gonna just settle in the pit, but I'm gonna sure complain about it. I'm gonna cry out, but I'm never gonna leave. I'm gonna stay there, I'm gonna complain and whine and and talk about how awful it is, but I'm just gonna sit there and do it. I'm never gonna turn and leave. I would say that while those in Israel were consecrated and were in a house of shame, these folks were in a house of blame. Because in their understanding, yes, there is some guilt here, but then if you look in verses 17 and verses 20, they don't say anything else about their guilt. This is what they say. Verse 17 says, the way of the Lord is not just. They say the same thing again. Yet you Israelites say in verse 20, the way of the Lord is not just. Their thinking is, if I start out righteous, if my line is righteous, then my present rebellion shouldn't count against me. One who has, one who has walked in righteousness but now tur- turns to sin, they're saying, God, you should cut him some slack. Because they did a lot of good things. You're not being fair that we have to feel this right now. But we know it's not like earning points, right? It's not like our righteous points, we hope they outweigh our wicked points and that we end up going with the higher amounts. God tells Ezekiel, not only is that a wrong way of thinking, he's telling them they are trusting in their own righteousness. And that's a dangerous place to be. When we do this, we are foolishly being confident that, hey, I'm pretty good. And the fact that we've done enough good to impress God, that he owes us, that we are so good, I am so good, I can walk into any sin, I can walk into any temptation, and it's really not going to affect me. I can dabble a little and it's just fine. And so that was their thinking. When salvation doesn't come, what they start receiving is the fruit of their rebellion. They lash out. Yes, they say, ouch, this hurts. But then they say, God, you're being so unfair to me right now. Why are you giving me this pain? You must be the one to blame. And they argue and they debate God's word. And this shows they're not really repentant. They're hurting, but they're not repentant. They don't understand that their actions have put them there. Repentant sinners understand that they have sinned and they don't argue or try and twist the word of God. What their cries of that's not fair really show is this warped sense of entitlement, which blinds the crier from being able to see that they need forgiveness too. But this is the thing, this is what God says to them. These wayward, whining, blind runaways, that's what they are. His message is simple, come home. He just tells them to come home. If you look in verse 11, say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. So turn, turn from your evil ways. Why, why will you die, people of Israel? What this tells us is God, he finds no joy in punishing the wicked, the wicked dying in their own wickedness. Think of it, it would make sense that God would grieve the death of a righteous person, but the death of a wicked person? 
The death of Israel that turned their back on you so many times? Really? But it grieves him. He finds no joy in giving them what they want, but he will still do it. But this is the thing. God is going to do everything in his power short of forcing us to choose him to bring us to his kingdom. He is going to do everything possible, whatever he needs to, to try and have us come to his kingdom. I read a commentary that said, choosing to go to hell and actually getting there is a very hard trip to make because God in love is going to fight you every step of the way. Anything to keep you from this harm. Even his punishment is still meant not to hurt you, but to turn you, to lead you to repentance. It's not to make you pay. And he's telling them, just turn. Turn from your ways. Why? Why in the world would you choose to die? I'm going to do everything possible to stop you from this madness. This isn't an angry God saying this. This is a God whose heart is breaking. Why? Why would you choose to die? But in order, because he is God, in order to enter his kingdom, his home, his house, there are requirements of justice and righteousness. And so what God is showing here is his heart. His joy is to see people turn and come back to him. He's pleading here, and God wouldn't plead with his children if he didn't think it was possible they would turn. He has a simple solution here. To turn is a very simple direction. You're walking this way, okay? Turn around and go this way, and take steps of faith, and you are walking home. That's where you go, not to a house of shame, not to a house of blame, not to a house bent on our destruction, but a life in God's kingdom. He says, come home. And we learn a little bit about God's house, about dwelling in his presence. Have you ever seen those family signs that people have in their houses for like the family rules? Like we do hugs, we say grace, we keep the toilet seat down. Like those kind of lists, do you know what I mean? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Family rules? Okay, I see some nodding heads. All right. So think about this. What we're going to read in verse 12 and on is basically like God's house rule, saying, this is what I'm expecting. This is what it means to be in my home. Our past, we're going to find that there is no merit system in God's house. That our past does not define our ability to enter. Go to verse 12. Therefore, son of man, say to your people, if someone who is righteous disobeys, that person's former righteousness will count for nothing. And if someone who is wicked repents, that person's former wickedness will not bring condemnation. The righteous person who sins will not be allowed to live even though they were formerly, formerly righteous. If I tell a righteous pers person that they will surely live, but then they trust in their own righteousness, that means that self-righteous, trusting in my own abilities, and do evil, none of the righteous things that a person has done will be remembered. They will die for the evil they have done. And if I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, I warn them, but they turn away from their sin and they do what is just and it is right. If they give back what they took and pledge for a loan, return what they have stolen, follow the decrees that give life and do no evil, that person will surely live. They will not die. None of the sins that person has committed will be remembered against them. They have done what is just and is right and they will surely live. So God is giving him these two scenarios. We have the person who's been righteous, done good things, but then falls to self-righteousness, which is a gateway of destruction. Their previous goodness doesn't save them. And yet the other person who's lived a wicked life, a rough life, they are welcomed in when they choose to turn, to course correct, to go home to God. And this flies in the face of the, this very fatalistic and privileged mindset of the exiles. They would have it 
that humanity is bound to their past, to their forefathers, and that if they had righteousness in their heritage, in their roots, they were good to go. Well, you know what? They didn't go back far enough. Because if we go back to saying that we are bound to our past, to our forefathers, well, that's Adam and Eve, which means we are all condemned because we all carry that sin. And Christ, he taught about this in Matthew 20. There's that parable of the landowner where he is inviting workers to his field all day long. Some come early in the morning and work all day. Some come in the last hours and work for that last hour. And they each receive the same payment. He paid them all the same because in God's house, in his kingdom, we're all equal. It doesn't matter what time in the day you come to the fields. Your presence there means you are able to receive his grace. It's not a gift for work done. It's a gift of grace. Now, if this was God's sign for his house, we would also find that in God's house, faith and good works go hand in hand. They always are together. It doesn't mean that good works earn you your salvation, but it's a reflection of your faith. What did God say about the wicked person? That he lived out the decrees that give life. We know that turning back towards home is a step of faith, and as we walk that road back, faith will inspire good works, and those are the fruits of our restoration. What did Zacchaeus do? He met the Lord and then he paid those back. He gave his money and Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because of what you, because of my grace and because of the fruits of your faith. A step of faith inspired action in the sinner and salvation came to his house. Our regret and remorse when moved to repentance will be acted out in good works that are the fruit of God restoring us in his home. Keep going in verse 17. It says, Yet your people say the word of the Lord is not just. We already heard that. But it is their way that's not just. If a righteous person turns from their righteousness and does evil, they will die for it. And if a wicked person turns away from their wickedness and does what is just and right, they will live by doing so. Yet you Israelites say the way of the Lord is not just, but I will judge each of you according to your own ways. We already talked about how the Israelites said, you're not fair, God. You're not fair to us. Cut us some slack. And you know what? To be honest, God's house isn't fair. Because if it was fair, God's house would be empty except for God. If it was fair in the world's standards, we would all have to pay. Our merit can never pay off the debt penalty of sin to get us into God's house. We would be sitting on the curb with our idols, feeling both blame and shame. I read a story this past week. It was from over a century ago, and there was this man named Shamel, and he was a leader of this um, group that was fighting against the Tsarist regime in Russia. And there started to be, in their campground, a lot of stealing that was happening between the families and the soldiers. And so he had to do something kind of extreme. And so he put forth a penalty that if you were caught stealing, you would receive a hundred lashes. And just moments, days after he made this penalty, his own mother was caught stealing. And so he's in this quandary, what do I do? I love my mother. I love her with all of my heart. I only want for her good. But the penalty has to be paid or the army will dissolve and chaos will ensue. So finally he makes up his mind But instead, that day, instead of his mother receiving the lashes, he took her place. He moved her out, and he stepped in. He bore the penalty she rightfully and fairly deserved because his love for her prevailed. We can be in God's house because his love for us prevails. He loves us and pays our penalty, and we have to decide as individuals if we're going to choose to live in that grace, in his love. Two more quick things. In his house, we're going to smell like sheep. 
it's going to smell like sheep. And it's going to be a pleasant smell, actually. If you move on to chapter 34, we're not going to get into that much today. But it talks about God saying, I'm going to be your shepherd. We talked about that in, in the Gospel of John when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. In verse 11 in chapter 34, it says, For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. As our good shepherd, we get to be sheep and he gathers us together and brings us home. He provides pleasant pastures, tends to us personally. It says he binds up when we are injured. He strengthens us when we are weak and he allows us to rest in his house and he gives us peace in divine justice. And that brings me to the last rule for the day. When we choose to repent, to give up the idols, which to be honest, it's hard to think because like we don't go around worshiping statues, right? But idols get in the way. It's the things, the people, the places that we focus more on than God. When we get to see when we're in his house that God has been in it, in our lives and through our lives from the very beginning. In his house, when you look at the photo albums, you'll see him in every picture. When you tell the stories, you're gonna realize he's always the main character. Even when we have put ourselves in homes of shame, homes of blame, he has been there extending his hand to bring us back. Hosea 11, one through four, and Michelle, if you wanna start playing, that's fine. Hosea 11, one through four says this, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son, but the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to idols and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim, that's Israel, to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bonds of love. To them, I was like the one who lifts a little child to my cheek and I bent down to feed them. What God is saying there is, I've been with you from the very start. He was with Israel from the beginning, loving, providing, healing, leading. And he was always faithfully their father, but they'd forgotten what it meant to be his beloved children, what they would receive. And guys, it's easy to do that, to get busy and to forget that I'm God's beloved child to compromise our priorities and become unfaithful, to stubbornly rebel and ignore the hands that heal us time and time again, and to run away and get lost. But this is the thing, we run away from home, we get lost, but God never loses us. He's always there. He's always ready to bring us home when we turn and we ask him, he just says, turn. Just turn to me and start walking home. Ephesians 2, 13 says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Do we access that today? And so today I I want you just to be thinking and thinking about as we go into prayer and as we sing, whose house are you in? Where's home for you? Are you in God's home or do you feel like you're just one step outside? Because one step outside is really easy to take two and then three and then run away. But God is saying, I'm right there with you. From the very start, I will stay with you and I will be faithful to you. Turn around and come home. And if we know I am in God's house today, be thankful. God provided me this beautiful dwelling place. Give him thanks today. On the screen, we're gonna put up the words for our closing song today. And it's this tune, and it's a song I don't remember. Do we have the word? There we go. I hadn't, don't remember really have sung, singing this song before. The tune is familiar, the words were new for me. But the king of love, my shepherd is, who goodness faileth never, I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. But if you go to the next verse, This is the one I think that kind of fits today. 
And it reminds me of that, that lyric that says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave, right? Prone to, to go run away from home. This says, perverse and foolish, often I've strayed, but in love, he sought me out. Guys, he is going to do everything possible to turn you back home when you run away. And what does he do then? And on his shoulder, gently laid, and home rejoicing brought me. This past week, some friends of ours brought their baby to come see us, and it was so fun. And we decided to walk down to the ice cream store, but they forgot a carrier. So I am holding this baby the entire walk to the ice cream store. And she's small, but after a while, my arms were tired from carrying her, from protecting her in that way. And I had to kind of adjust and move and finally hand her off because I was tired. My arms were stiffening up. God never does that. He never does that. He never says, I just can't bear this anymore. I'm tired. It's been too long of a walk. I'm tired carrying. You know, he just keeps holding us and bringing us back home. So today, as we go into our time of prayer, and we're going to sing this song. I invite you to just think about where am I dwelling today? What's my home today? Pray for those that might not be in God's house, in his dwelling place. Pray for them. Pray that they will turn. Our prayers are powerful and God's love prevails. Won't you sing this with me?